podcast. Today is April 9th, Tuesday, 2024. I'm Rifat Mandan in California. And uh, we are continuing with our HEMPATH lecture series. And this is going to be the fourth lecture in this series. And our today's speaker is Dr. Sanam Logawi, who is very well known in the field of hematopathology. And currently she is associate professor mm -hmm of hematopathology in the uh, department there at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. And today she is going to talk about uh, WHO and ICC, its changes and how you would uh, integrate them in the diagnosis of AML and MDS. And as always for the viewers, please post your questions or comments in the chat box and chat windows for both uh, YouTube and Facebook, and uh, we will pass them on to Dr. Lagavi at the end of the lecture. And thank you, Dr. Lagavi, for joining us today. So over to you now. Uh, hi, everybody. And thank you so much, Dr. Manan, for inviting me uh, for this lecture. I'm very excited to be with you today. And uh, thank you for giving your um, time in the day to me uh, and to HEMPAT. Uh, so I hope to use this hour to go through some of the changes that have been incorporated into the new classifications for hematopathology, um, using some case examples uh, to highlight some of the some of the discrepancies that exist between the two classifications and he, how we approach them in everyday practice. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn off my rate or uh, my video and um, start the lecture. All right. So as you know, there are you know they, they they used to be new classifications, not so much anymore. They were actually both published in 2022, which believe it or not, has been you know two years now. Uh, so not so new anymore, but they're still the newest classifications um, in the field. So the WHO, uh, the summary paper for the WHO was published in Leukemia in July of 2022. And the ICC, um, the uh, which is a novel classification system proposed by the International Consensus Classification Group, was published in Blood uh, in June of 2022. Uh, so you'll see that mainly the, the changes that have been incorporated or the, the novel classification that has been proposed by ICC uh, is mostly molecularly driven. There's a lot more molecular in the diagnosis and classification of heme malignancies, even more so than before. Uh, but there is a common theme to both classifications with really some minor uh, discrepancies ex existing between the two. Uh, so I'll start with myelodysplastic uh, syndrome, previously known as myelodysplastic syndrome, now referred to as myelodysplastic neoplasms by the WHO to highlight the neoplastic nature of this disease. Uh, but the abbreviation has stayed the same, as you can see. There is a hierarchical classification for MDS that is largely driven by the presence or absence of genomic alterations. So there, the main, there are two main branches. One is MDS defined by genetic abnormalities, and the other one is in the absence of defining genetic alterations, we refer them to as MDS morphologically defined. So what are the genetic abnormalities that are currently classified uh, or considered as disease defining by the WHO? One is uh, isolated deletion 5Q. So this category is referred to as MDS with low glass and isolated deletion 5Q. As the name implies here, you cannot have increased blast, so no more than 5% blast in the bone marrow or more than 2% blast in the peripheral blood. In that case, you would go in the increased uh, blast category. And, uh, you know, despite what the name implies, isolation deletion or isolation, isolated deletion of 5Q actually allows for one additional chromosomal abnormality as long as that chromosome is not chromosome 7, right? So you can still fit into that category. MDS with low blast and SF3B1 mutation is the other category. So if you remember the previous iteration of the WHO, we had MDS with ring sitter blast. This is largely the same category because the majority of MDS with ring sitter blast do have SF3B1 mutations. Here, uh, the one uh, exception that is allowed by the WHO, but not by the ICC, as you will see in the next slide, is if you have a case where you don't know the SF3B1 status, or you actually do not have an SF3B1 mutation, but you have greater than equal to or greater than 15% ring sitter blast, you can still classify the case in this category, but call it MDS with ring sitter blast. Uh, here, you cannot have deletion 5Q, you cannot have monosomy 7 or a complex karyotype, 
And the WHO requires an SF3B1 mutation variant allele frequency of 5%, okay? And this will become important in a case that I'll show you later. Uh, the next category is MDS with biallelic TP53 inactivation. Uh, so what do we mean here by biallelic TP53 inactivation? It essentially means that you have an alteration in both copies of your TP53, either by way of multiple mutations or mutation and copy number loss with deletion of the wild type allele or copy not neutral loss of heterozygosity. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. Typically, as you know, these cases have a complex karyotype. So it's very, very uncommon to have a diploid karyotype, really TP53 mutated MDS, but there are exceptions. And here you cannot have more than 20% blast because obviously you will be in the AML category then, but for now, the presence of a TP53 alteration in the WHO classification is not disease defining. It's not AML defining, right? Okay. So then if you don't have any of these three categories, then you revert back to your morphologically defined categories. If your blast count is lower than 2% in the blood and 5% in the bone marrow, you're MDS with low blast. If you have a bone marrow cellularity that is less than 25% adjusted for age, uh, or in people that are older than 70 years old, it's less than 20%, then you're hypoplastic MDS. This is only recognized by the WHO and not by the ICC. And the logic behind this recognition is that these patients typically respond to immunosuppressive therapies. So the WHO thought that it was important to um, signify and you know, a comment in your reports that this is hypoplastic MDS. And then if you have increased blasts, and this is you know broken down into two further categories, increased blast one and increased blast two, with the numbers that you can see here based on the percentage of the blast in the peripheral blood or bone marrow, um, you fall into the MDS with increased blast category. And then one uh, thing that I wanna highlight here is when we go into the ICC classification, you'll notice that if you have more than 10% blast in the peripheral blood or bone marrow, ICC regards that as MDS slash AML. And while the WHO does not recognize that as a distinct category, they do advise that cases with more than 10% blast may be regarded as AML equivalent for therapy and clinical trial enrollment purposes when deemed appropriate by the treating physician. And then MDS with fibrosis, these cases have increased blasts uh, and obviously moderate to severe fibrosis. One caveat here, again, is that these that MDS with fibrosis in general is enriched for TP53 mutations. So remember that TP53, biallelic TP53 inactivation trumps MDS with fibrosis. So if you have that, then you go into the TP53 inactivation. But if you don't have TP53 and you have increased blast and fibrosis, then you're regarded as MDS with fibrosis. And then the one thing that has been omitted from the classification in the uh, WHO is the, the number of dysplastic lineages. There are subsequent studies by the ICMDS group that you know hopefully you'll see in publication very soon that do actually show that morphologic dysplasia, the number of lineages that are dysplastic is important. So I would say that for now, at least this is what I'm doing. I'm still you know, indicating in my reports, the lineages that are dysplastic and the number, you know, whether it's single lineage or multi-lineage dysplasia. Uh, the ICC is very similar. You have the same genetic and uh, morphologically defined categories. There are subtle differences. Uh, for MDS with SF3B1 mutation, uh, the variant LE frequency required for SF3B1 here is 10%. And remember in the WHO it was 5%. And then the presence of a RUNCS1 mutation excludes SF3B1, you know, classification as SF3B1. So this is, you know, this is a, a kind of a difference between the two classifications. And then for MDS with mutated TP53, the ICC also requires multi-hit TP53 or biallelic inactivation. But here, the upper limit of the blast count is 9%. Because once you, uh, you know, cross that 9% threshold, then you are in the MDS slash AML category. And we'll talk about this more. And then in terms of the, the MDS uh, morphologically defined categories, so this is one category that exists in the W, sorry, in the ICC, but not the WHO. And this is MDS without dysplasia. These are cases that are defined by the presence of a cytogenetic abnormality 
namely deletion seven or seven Q or a complex karyotype. I have to say in my experience, it is very, very uncommon to see a case that has a complex karyotype without dysplasia, but this is something that is you know, included in the ICC. In the WHO, these cases would be referred to as FICA, clonal cytopenia of uncertain significance, because the WHO still requires the presence of morphologic dysplasia for, uh, for MDS. And then uh, the, w, the ICC still requires indicating whether the dysplasia is single lineage or multi-lineage. And as I said, I think this is good practice. Uh, MDS with excess blasts, again, the upper limit here for ICC is 9% because once you cross 9%, you're in the MDS AML category. All right, so you know, we talked a lot about the allelic status of uh, TP53 and MDS. Why is this so important? This really comes from a seminal study that was published by Elsa Bernard and Ellie Papa Manuel. Uh, at the time, they were both at MSK. Elsa is now in Paris, uh, and you know this is a this is a study that kind of fortuitously came out of the IPFSM classification. So Elsa and Ellie had noticed that the you know when they looked at their MDS cases, patients that had one TP53 mutation essentially in terms of their peripheral blood parameters and in terms of their leukemia survival and overall survival, behaved like patients that had wild type TP53. The detrimental effect or, you know, the very poor prognosis associated with TP53 mutations was really limited to the patients that had multi-hit TP53 lesions. So how do we define multi-hit TP53? You know, if you have more than one mutation, that's easy, right? And I just do want to, you know, highlight a caveat here. If you think about the way we detect mutations, most uh, laboratories, most clinical laboratories do next generation sequencing. We're not doing, you know, we're just doing targeted next generation bulk sequencing. We're not doing single cell sequencing. So we really don't know when we have two mutations, if they're, if they're affecting the two different alleles, the two different copies but it is implied based on the biology of TP53 being a tumor suppressor gene that when you have more than one mutation, it's usually in two different alleles, okay? So that's easy. If you have one mutation and your other allele is deleted, either you, know, you see it on the karyotype that 17P is deleted or you detect it by fish, then that is also considered to be multi-hit because you lose function of TP53 by one mutation and then the other wild type copy is deleted, you end up with two abnormal uh, TP53s. And then the, the third category, which is kind of the most complicated clinically detecting it for us is copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. What is copy neutral loss of heterozygosity? It's essentially this you know, similar mecha mechanism, if you remember you know, back in college biology of uniparental disomy. So what happens is your normal copy gets deleted and your mutated copy gets duplicated. So if you look by fish, or if you look at the karyotype, you still have two copies, but you have two abnormal copies, right? And what happens is in these cases, we use variant allele frequency as a surrogate for copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. If you see one mutation that has a very high VAF, and you know that is kind of arbitrarily defined as more than 50%, then you can assume that you have copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. Okay. How about MDL uh, or AML? Uh, does TP53 matter in M AML? Uh, and you know, if, if you look at the AML and MDS literature now, there's a big push to combine all high grade MDS, you know, myeloid neoplasms that harbor TP53 mutations. And this really stemmed from this paper by, um, by Rob and uh, colleagues uh, when in 2022, in a paper in Blood, they actually published on a large series of patients with MDS and AML. Uh, this is 2,200 uh, you know, combined patients. 10% of them had TP53 mutations. Median variant allele frequency in this group was high. It was 47. And 76% had biallelic TP53 alterations, as we described here. But if you look at the differences between MDS heel being the red curve and AML, the, uh, the blue curve, really in terms of their overall survival or any other parameters of clinical significance, they did not have any difference. And at least in this group, there was no difference between monoallelic and biallelic status. So it seems like when you have increased blasts, then that allelic status becomes less important, right? Okay. 
So let's move on to SF3B1 mutated MDS. Uh, you know, SF3B1 mutated MDS has been recognized now for, I, I think, over 10 years. But, you know, it, it's not that old, right? So these are some of the seminal papers that described SF3B1 mutations. And again, it was first described by Ellie Papamanoel in this uh uh, in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. So, you know, how, how, do, how, how do we define it? What, it? what are the characteristics of SF3B1 mutated MDS? First of all, it's considered one of the lower grade variants of MDS, right? Patients typically present with anemia, microcytic anemia. Uh, they typically have single lineage dys dysplasia. If you, if you restrict the disease to truly isolated SF3B1 muta uh, mutated MDS, if you really look, the marked dysplasia is in the erythroid series, right? So the bone marrow is typically erythroid predominant. You'll see very marked dyserythropoiesis. Uh, basophilic stippling is very common, of course, because they have ring sideroblasts. Um, and then, you know, when you do an iron stain, it's very easy to see numerous, numerous ring sideroblasts. And it's typically associated with good prognosis. I put question, you know, question marks here because I'm going to highlight some cases for you that, you know, that'll kind of raise some questions in your mind. So if you go back to the International Working Group criteria, you know, a, a few years after MDS with ring sideroblasts and SF3B1 mutation was um, described, the IWG, IWG proposed some criteria to, to make this an entity. So what are the criteria? Obviously, the patient has to be cytopenic because if you don't have cytopenia, you don't have MDS, right? So you detect an SF3B1 mutation, a somatic SF3B1 mutation, morphologic dysplasia, plus or minus ring sideroblast, and low blast, right? Low blast in the peripheral blood and bone marrow. And these patients, you know, very well respond to Luspatercept, which is important clinically. All right, so I'll show you a, uh, a case example. Here's a patient, 60-year-old woman, presents with uh, really mild anemia. She has thrombocytopenia, right? Her platelet is 45. The white blood cell count is not that bad. Here's her bone marrow. You can see there are dysplastic megakaryocytes on the bone marrow core biopsy at first glance, uh, right? Very easy to see them. Here's one. Um, and then uh, you can also appreciate that there's erythroid predominance and erythroid dysplasia. And some of the, you know, the granule sites don't look too bad. They, they're adequately granular. They're adequately segmented. But there's definitely erythroid and uh, megakaryocytic dysplasia. Okay. So here you have an SF3B1 mutation and a DNMT3 uh, splice mutation. Uh, and 1% loss. So, um, sorry, the SF3B, that's a typo. So the SF3B1 mutation has a 6% variability frequency. So as I told you, the cutoff here is, uh, you know, for WHO and for ICC is different. So by WHO, this patient classifies as SF3B1 mutated MDS, uh, but by ICC, they don't, right? By ICC, because they don't have that 10% variability frequency, this is MDS NOS with multilineage dysplasia. So let's let's look at the risk stratification in this patient. Um, if you look at this patient and use the IPSSM calculator, which is you know here in this uh, link very easily accessible, uh, given the peripheral blood parameters, the number of mutations, everything, this patient has a leukemia-free survival of 5.9 years, overall survival of six years predicted, right, and an AML transformation rate of 1.7. Now let's look at another patient. This is an 86-year-old man. Uh, again, there's some anemia. Here, actually, the platelet count is normal and the white count looks good, right? Very mild anemia. Here's the bone marrow as per its mirror. You can see there's multi-lineage dysplasia. Here's a dysplastic megakaryocyte, the erythroids. Here's some bilobation, uh, some a asynchronous maturation. The granule sites here do look dysplastic, unlike the other ones. And there, it, there is increased blast, but 4% patchy, right? Um, I, I counted about 4% overall, but in some areas, you can see they're clustering and there's more. Okay, so this percent has fifty. This person has fifty percent ring sideroblast, a diploid karyotype, and then on their NGS they have an SF three B one mutation, right? With again a variant delay frequency of six percent, and a bunch of other mutations, including a U two A F one, ASXL one. So these are bad mutations, we know, right? A KRAS and an NF one, so a RAS pathway mutations in addition to this SF three B one. Okay, so again here the we have the same classification dilemma. The classification is different. But if you put in the parameters for this patient in the IPSSM calculator, the, uh, the leukemia-free survival for this patient is actually 2.3 years. Compare that with the 5.9 years for the patient that we just saw before this, right? 
So, you know, in my mind, we look at these cases and this case in the middle is another example of an SF3B1 mutated MBS. So I look at these cases under my microscope and I say to myself, there's no way that these diseases are the same entity, right? So I just want to highlight for you that even though class, you know, we use mutations to classify, I think we need to look at the whole picture, right? So classification does not mean, it's not synonymous with prognostication. And I think these are some things that as pathologists, we have to be aware of, right? Okay. So here's a, a really nice study that was done by uh, the, the German group and published in Leukemia uh, in 2022. They looked at SF3B1 mut mutated MDF. Um, and really saw that blast percentage and genetic co-abnormalities are the, the main determinants of outcome in these patients. So if you have a deletion 5Q and a runx one it's independently prognostic. Um, and, and, you know, so that's really the reason behind the ICC excluding runx one and both classifications excluding deletion 5Q from this category. But if you really have an isolated SF3B1 mutation without other poor genetic prognosticators, really just having blast more than 5% does not seem to be that, that important. Okay, so we talked about P53. I want to just highlight something before I go to, into P53 mutated myeloid neoplasms in general. Um, and just, you know, uh, first of all, highlight this paper by Dr. Tasha Corey uh, and say that I use this regularly in my practice for any MDS or for any newly diagnosed AML, and I find it incredibly helpful. So the IHC does correlate really, really well with the presence of a mutation. You just have to kind of be aware of the patterns of staining. So the normal pattern of staining here is, you know, this is a wild type. Obviously, you have, this is a uh, mutation agnostic antibody, right? So it detects wild type or mutant P53. The, the issue is that when you have mutant P53, the mutant protein is resistant to MDM2 degradation, and so it accumulates in the, in the nucleus. So in the wild type pattern, you see some faint staining in a subset of cells. But if you have a mutation where the protein is not being degraded, you have a lot of bright staining nuclei, and really the three plus is what, what counts. But then you also have one other pattern, which is this negative truncated or null pattern, where you see complete absence of staining. If you see here, there's some internal control. The endothelial cells and histiocytes are faintly staining, but the actual mononuclear myeloid cells are all just dead negative. So that's also abnormal. It usually correlates with either frame shift or nonsense mutations. And then there's this kind of in-between level. There is some overexpression, but it's not as dark and bright as the three plus nuclei in the, uh, in the mutated case. This is something, you know, I want you to be aware of. I've been burnt before by this pattern. It's a pitfall. It usually correlates with cases that have signaling pathway mutations. But again, it's not 3 plus, and this, this case was actually wild type. And one other thing is that the mutation, the IHC is agnostic of the allelic status, right? So it does not tell you whether it's biallelic or not. It just tells you that there's a mutation. And again, just to highlight, so here's the different intensities of staining. As I said, only the three plus staining counts. And this is, you know, uh, what you should be looking for. Okay, so MDS with biallelic TP53 inactivation. I talked to you about this. Here's an example of it. You can see that this case has multi-lineage dysplasia. Uh, the erythroids are very dysplastic. There's megakaryocytic dysplasia. There's uh, granulocytic dysplasia. On the karyotype, here, you know, this is very interesting because if you look, the um, so there's there's deletion 17, right? So there's a minus 17, and the there's a mutation also. So this is biallelic, but why what, what we described. On the other hand, here's another case of a myeloid neoplasm with fibrosis that I told you about. So if you look, this morphology, you know, you can tell even without the reticulin stain here that this bone marrow is very fibrotic because of the streaming, because of the crush that you see in the bone marrow. There's increased blast, but remember, most of these, uh, most of these uh, cases will have a very bad aspirate just because of the nature of the fibrosis in the bone marrow. But if, you, uh, you know, I did a P53 IHC on this case, and you can see that, you know, it's very, very overexpressed, abnormal, three plus staining. So even though this patient does have increased blast, they still have um, a TP53 mutation, which was actually biallelic. So in this case, this case is classified as MDS with biallelic TP53 inactivation by WHO. But because they have 16% blast by ICC, this is MDS slash AML with mutated TP53. 
Okay, so let's move on to acute myeloid leukemia. Acute myeloid leukemia is very similar, the classification in, in you know, both systems. It's very much genetically defined and classified. There are some subtle differences. So the uh, AML was defining genetic abnormalities. You can see the, the defining genetic abnormalities here. There's a lot of overlap between what is here now and what was here before. Some of the additions are now KMT2A, MECOM, and uh, NUP98. Uh, and NPM1. So there, there is no minimum blast requirement or blast threshold for these, although they do require increased blast. And so, you know, um, it, it's essentially 5%, right? So th there's no minimum, but there's there you have to have increased blast. But these are AML defined, okay? For CBPA, the WHO still requires 20% blast. And obviously for BCR able one, they still require 20% blast to avoid overcalling myeloid blast crisis of uh, CML. Uh, and then you have the AML myelodysplasia related, which we will talk about in depth. If you don't have any of these, it's AML uh, with uh, morphologically defined, right? Okay, so in the ICC, uh, it's pretty much the same logic, but the ICC enforces a 10% blast threshold. And this 10% also applies to CBPA for ICC. Uh, but BCR able remains 20% for uh, ICC as well. Uh, but remember, the, the ICC, so when you uh, pass the 9% the threshold, uh, if you don't have any of these AML defining genetic abnormalities, then you're in the MDS slash AML uh, category. And this includes TP53, myelodysplasia related, and NOS. Okay. So, you know, I talked to you about AML with CBPA mutations. There's been some change in the definition of CBPA mutations. So if you remember the previous iteration of the WHO, the 2016, uh, this category was defined as AML with biallelic CBPA mutations. That is no longer the case in, in, uh, in the ICC, but in the WHO, it's still retained as one subset, but really the majority of these cases uh, are the ones that have uh, mutations in the B-zip region of the gene. These are the ones that are associated with good prognosis, but it so happens that the majority, 90% of the biallelic CEBPAs actually do localize to this region. And so that's why they were included, uh, you know, initially in the 2016 WHO as having good prognosis and now retained in the current version of the WHO. But if you look at, you know, look at these patients, really the location of the mutation is what drives the good prognosis, not the biallelic status. And so that's something that you want to be aware of. I think for those of us that sign out molecular pathology reports, it's, it's important to note in your reports where the mutation falls, because that's not always readily apparent to maybe the treating physician, right? So you want to say whether it's in frame or not, and whether it falls in the BZIP region or not. Uh, all right, so now let's move on to AML with mutated TP53. So I talked about TP53 a lot. We talked about MDS with mutated TP53. As I said, no, uh, you know, in the ICC, this is, um, so, sorry, let me, let me rewind back a little bit. So AML with mutated TP53 is a distinct disease category in the ICC. In the WHO, AML with mutated TP53 is not a distinct entity because most cases fall into AML myelodysplasia related in the WHO. And I'll tell you why, because it's, you know, it's by virtue of essentially their complex karyotype, okay? So in the WHO, TP53 is disease defining in MDS, but not in AML. For ICC, TP53 is disease defining for MDS, MDS slash AML, and AML with TP53. The difference being that in MDS, you require multi-hit. So if you have, you know, blast less than 10%, you require a multi-hit to fit into this category. But once you reach, you know, or pass the 10% threshold, any somatic mutation, so any one mutation with a variant LE frequency of more than 10% puts you in this category. So based on the blast count, you're either in MDS slash AML or AML with mutated TP. Um, and so, you know, the, obviously we know that these patients do very poorly, but you may ask, you know, what about the, the clonal burden of TP53? Uh, there are some studies from before these publications, the, before the WHO uh, ICC, and many, many studies after the publication uh, that show that clonal size does matter. Uh, 
So in a, a study published by our group at MD Anderson, they showed that in intensely treated patients, so patients that receive cytarabine-based therapies, if you had AML and a TP53 mutated uh, VAF of more than 40%, you had significantly shorter overall survival. But in patients that were treated with low intensity therapies, this variant daily frequency did not seem to be prognostic. Conversely, in a paper that was you know, more recently published by, again, the German group, uh, they looked at the impact of TP53 single and double hit uh, status in AML and MDS. So the, the top panel is a AML patients and the bottom panel is MDS patients. So if you look here, you can see, first of all, the, you know, about like two thirds of the patients did have uh, biallelic hits. So either two mutations here, the, the tan color, the red color is mutation plus uh, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, and then the burgundy is mutation plus deletion. So most of them had uh, biallelic status. And if you looked at the survival, so the patients that had wild type TP53 had an overall survival of 21 months. If you had a single hit, eight months, but if you had a double hit, your overall survival was one month. So significantly different, even in, in the setting of AML. And MDS, this is just you know proving what was previously shown. Again, it is very prognostic, whether you have a uh, biallelic or a uh, single hit uh, TP53. But that being said, the prognostic relevance of TP53 mutation in AML is not straightforward, right? So if you have a, let's say, a core binding factor AML uh, or AML with PML RARA, and you have a TP53 aberration, it seems to have no prognostic influence, right? But if you have MDS, therapy-related MDS, uh, AML with KMT2A rearrangement, and you have TP53 aberrations, which seem to be actually more, more common, they do have prognostic significance, as we've shown before. And then there's also this, this um, middle category, uh, like AML with MECOM rearrangement, AML with, uh, or MDS with single lineage dysplasia, MDS with Del5Q, where it seems to have some prognostic influence, but it's not as detrimental as the other group. So I will show you a case example here of you know one one such disease. So this is a patient uh, that presented with newly diagnosed AML. So here you have the the very vacuolated monocytic looking glass with cup like nuclei. This is very very typical and characteristic of NPM1 mutated AML. Here I did an NPM1 IHC. Uh, you can see there's both cytoplasmic and nuclear staining. This is a mutation agnostic IHC. So it detects, you know, both mutant and wild type uh, NPM1. But as you know, NPM1 in normal cells is restricted to nuclei. So if you have cytoplasmic staining, that's a mutant pattern. So here, you know, obviously looking at this stain, I, I'll, you know, I know that this is an NPM1 mutated uh, MDS. Oh, I'm so sorry. My phone is ringing. But... Okay. And then... Um, if you have, uh, and then I also did a P53 IHC, and this is a very abnormal pattern, but you know, this was very surprising to me because typically you don't expect NPM1 and P53 mutations to co-occur together. And even looking at this, you can see the vast majority of the cells show abnormal patterning for both, abnormal patterns for both, which seems to tell me, you know, this is the exact same area if you look at this vessel. So this tells me that these are in, in the same clone, right? So you have a very high VAF uh, TP53 mutation, which seems to indicate that there's copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, as I told you before. And there's a high VAF NPM1, like a dominant clone of NPM1 mutated. Um, but, you know, so how do I classify this case? Uh, the classification is still NPM1 mutated AML because NPM1 trumps TP53 in the classification hierarchy, but prognostication is not the same. So the ELN uh, advises that if you have an NPM1 mutated AML with adverse risk cytogenetics, this should be classified as adverse risk. And this is how this patient actually was classified. And this patient didn't even make it through induction therapy. They unfortunately passed away within two weeks of diagnosis. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what we used to refer to as uh, therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. So these are uh, now in the in the WHO. It's still regarded as a distinct category, and the the class the hierarchy in the hierarchy of classification, having a post cytotoxic therapy uh, myeloid neoplasm is you know the, the essentially regarded as being prognostically important in the ICC. Uh, it's not a separate category. 
but they do advise that it should be, you know, um, um, commented on. So you would you would class in both classifications, you would classify the case with its genetics, but in the WHO, it would be a post cytotoxic therapy, uh, and then whatever it is genetically. In the ICC, the genetics would come first, and then post therapy comes second. Uh, I'll show you an example here. This is an acute. Um, it's actually an acute um, erythroid leukemia, right? So this is a post cytotoxic therapy in the WHO. Because there's erythroid predominance here shown by CD71, the e hair and stain, you can see highlights numerous immature erythroids. This is P53 mutated as indicated here by the IHC. And you can see the, the very abnormal erythroid cells and the erythroid blast, and here's an abnormal megakaryocyte. But in the ICC, um, acute erythroid leukemia is not recognized as a distinct entity. It's regarded as acute myeloid leukemia with mutated TP53, so it's lumped into that category. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the, the therapy relatedness remains a distinct class in the WHO, and, and erythroid differentiation uh, remains a distinct uh, uh, feature in the WHO, but not in the ICC. Uh, so, you know, is therapy relatedness, uh, is it important or not? Uh, I think it is important, you know, you, you may argue that some of this has to do with the baseline features of, you know, the baseline characteristics of the patients. Obviously, the, the patients that have therapy-related myeloid neoplasms have already had a, another malignancy. They've had chemotherapy, so they're, they're in, in, in a more poor uh, status to begin with. But they do seem to have poor outcomes, even if you look at genetically matched disease. So if you look at TP53 mutated neoplasms, irrespective of the elitic status of P53, the patients that have therapy-related disease tend to do worse than patients that have non-therapy-related disease. And then here, really, the, the allelic status of TP53 is, does not seem to be prognostic, but if they have VAF less than 10%, which means you know maybe they just have a bystander chip clone, then those patients tend to do a little bit better. But once you pass the 10% varying allele frequency, really those patients tend to do very poorly in the setting of therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. And then, um, you know, we talked about this uh, before, but I just want to highlight a another way of looking at allelic status. Uh, and this is just, you know, don't, don't get uh, confused by this very complicated diagram. This is an abstract that was presented at ASH in 2022, and they looked at machine learning algorithms to predict allelic status of TP53 in AML. So in this study, using, you know, uh, very, very complicated statistical models uh, and using known by allelic and known monoallelic cases as their gold standard, they came off with a variant allele frequency cutoff of 23% uh, that, you know, was associated with high-risk features and predicted by probable biallelic loss of TP53. Okay, so now let's move on to AML, myelodysplasia related. If you remember in the WHO 2016, there were three ways to get to myelodysplasia related changes. That was if you had a established history of a chronic myeloid neoplasm, if you had morphologic dysplasia, so profound morphologic dysplasia, which means uh, dysplastic lineages in more than two cell lines, and also more than 30% in each lineage. And then MR defining cytogenetic abnormality. So that has been revised in both the WHO and the ICC. Here, morphologic dysplasia is no longer regarded as a feature or criterion in either one, because we know now very well that there are good risk, favorable risk AMLs, including NPM1 mutated AML or 821 that have very profound dysplasia, which has no prognostic value. So the WHO retains the antecedent you know, history of MDS or an MDS MPN as a feature. Uh, the ICC does not. Uh, and then they both share the cytogenetic changes, the MR-defining cytogenetic changes, and the MR-defining mutations. The mutations are a little bit different, as I'll show you in the next slide. Okay. So for the WHO, um, really the cytogenetic abnormalities remained uh, as you know they were before. There's minor differences in the cytogenetic abnormalities. The ICC recognizes trisomy 8 and deletion 20Q as also MR defining. The WHO does not. With respect to the genes uh, that are um, MR uh, defining, uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of overlap with the exception of RUNCS1 that is included in the ICC but not recognized in the WHO. Uh, I think the WHO decided to exclude RUNCS1 because of the heterogeneous nature. Well, you know, because some of these are germline mutated, uh, but, you know, it is recognized that RUNCS1 is associated with poor prognosis in, in the setting, you know, somatic RUNCS1 mutations in the setting of um, AML. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. And then obviously the chromatin, uh, uh, the uh, chromatin associated genes and the splicing factors uh, are also uh, recognized as is EVH2 and V4. Okay, so let's look at another case. Here's an AML classification dilemma for you. This is a 70-year-old woman with fatigue and shortness of breath, uh, presents with cytopenias. If you look at the bone marrow, there's erythroid predominance. Uh, there's multilineage dysplasia. You can see the megakaryocytes are dysplastic. And then there's occasional loss, maybe in the range of 5%. Um, and then the ancillary studies here show an inversion 3 leading to a MECOM rearrangement. And here's a break-apart fish probe that shows you the separation of the signals. Uh, so MECOM is rearranged here, and there's a uh, monosomy 7 in addition to the MECOM rearrangement as well. So I told you there was 5% loss in this case. So by WHO, this is classified as AML because MECOM is AML defining in the WHO. But because it doesn't have 10% loss, it is still regarded as MDS, NOS, with multilineage dysplasia in the IC. Um, again, so, you know, maybe prognostically not so important uh, because it, whether you call this patient MDS or AML, uh, this patient is going to have very poor outcome because of the uh, MECOM rearrangement, particularly in the setting of a monosomy 7. Uh, but, you know, this, this may have implications for clinical trial eligibility enrollment. So that's why it is, uh, it is really recommended now uh, to include both classifications when you can. Uh, so that the treating physician has options to enroll the patient in the best, you know, therapy that's uh, the trial that's available to them. Uh, so I'm going to finish by, you know, highlighting some of the changes to the ELN. I think we covered a lot of this in, in the talk. Uh, essentially, ELN risk stratification is by genetics at initial diagnosis. So you have your favorable categories, uh, obviously the core binding factor AMLs, and then mutated MPM1, if you don't have FLT3, is favorable risk, FLT3 ITD. And then BZIP in frame mutated CEBPA, which we talked about. If you have a FLT3 ITD, regardless of MPM1 status, you're at least in the intermediate uh, risk category. KMT2A rearrangement, if the partner is MLLT3, it's intermediate. Otherwise, it's adverse. And then, you know, MECOM, uh, BCR ABLE, NUP, uh, DECNUP. Uh, obviously, monosomy 5, 7, 17, and the uh, MR mutated genes and TP53 are all regarded at, as adverse risk genetic abnormalities. So the significant changes compared to 2017 are, if you remember, uh, there was a threshold for FLT3 allelic ratio in the 2017. That is no longer a criterion. So any FLT3 ITD puts you in the intermediate risk uh, category. And this is really, it was uh, because of methodological inconsistencies between laboratories and obviously recognizing the impact of FLT3 inhibitors in these patients and the role of MRD status in treatment decisions. Uh, so the allelic ratio has been removed. Uh, the mutations have been added. So these were not in the 2017 uh, version. They're added in the 2022. These are the MR-related mutations. Adverse risk cytogenetics plus NPM1 now defines adverse risk. That, you know, the, the case that I showed you was uh, one such case. And then uh, only in-frame VZIP mutations of, of CEBPA are considered favorable. We talked about this. And then there's a couple of uh, genetic abnormalities that have been added to the adverse risk group. And one important thing is, you know, hyperdiploid karyotypes. So these are when you have multiple copies of, of the chromosomes. So even if you have a very you know, what looks like a complex karyotype with multiple abnormalities, but if it's a hyperdiploid karyotype, that does not count as an adverse risk or as a complex karyotype. And then if you don't have any of these genetic abnormalities, you obviously in the WHO, you fall into the AML by differentiation. Uh, this is not recognized distinctly in the ICC. And then this is very similar to the FAB, right? So it's just uh, by differentiation. And the ones that I want to kind of highlight here for you are the monocytic erythroid and megakaryoblastic leukemias. I think it is still important to make this distinction in your reports because, you know, they're, 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 it has therapeutic implications. Uh, 
And, and I just want to highlight that by showing you this case that we talked about acute erythroid leukemia, right? So acute erythroid leukemia, as I said, is defined in the WHO as a distinct disease entity, not in ICC. Uh, in ICC, it's regarded as AML with TP53 mutation. The reason behind that is that almost all cases of acute erythroid leukemia have biallelic TP53 mutations, okay? But in the WHO, they still advise that you should make the diagnosis of acute erythroid leukemia and say that it's TP53 mutated. Why is that important? Because if you look at the literature, there is, uh, you know, there is very, very um, um, good literature that, that shows that in AML, if you have erythroid or megakaryocytic differentiation or monocytic differentiation, these patients tend to be resistant to BCL2 inhibitors or venetoclax, which is really one of the main uh, main uh, agents in AML therapy now. And so, you know, this may inform the choice of therapy for your for your physicians. So even if you don't by, you know, whatever classification you use, I think it's very important to note in your reports if there's prominent monocytic differentiation or if, it, if there's prominent megakaryocytic or erythroid differentiation. Um, I think I already covered this. So I, you know, I'm going to end by, uh, by this one slide saying that uh, I, I think it's great that we have two new classifications. I think, uh, you know, if, while it's not ideal that we have two, I think having these two and the discrepancies that they had, if you want to look on the bright side, uh, kind of made people look into the differences and really try and validate the differences and see what's really important. And there's a very good body of literature that has come out of, you know, these studies. Uh, but regardless of this, I think, you know, we have to be mindful that our classifications don't just exist in silo. They inform prognosis, they inform treatment decisions, reimbursement, clinical trial eligibility. Uh, you know, let's say if I call someone MDS, they may not get reimbursed for flow MRD by their insurance, whether, you know, uh, as opposed to, you know, if they get a diagnosis of AML, they may get reimbursed for so I think there are implications beyond just the initial pathology report that we have to be mindful of. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the future, we can have an improved classification system that is uniform and that can be used to best treat our patients and, um, you know, move forward. Um, and so with that, I am going to stop sharing. Um, let's see. How do I do this? And turn on my video. So if you have any uh, questions, I am very happy to take them now. Thank you so much, Dr. Laghavi. Of course, my pleasure. And this was really amazing. Uh, I I have seen a couple of questions. There is one question that I have put in the chat box. Can you have a look at it? Sure. So uh, someone asked, how can advancements in molecular biology, such as next generation sequencing and gene expression profiling, be leveraged to improve the early detection and prognosis and treatment of acute myeloid leukemia, while also addressing challenges such as genetic heterogeneity and therapy resistance? Uh, so of course, you know, like, most of what we talked about really was informed by advancements in molecular biology, right? So when you talk about early detection, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what, what we're talking about here. So if you think about AML biology in general, really the, um, the vast majority of AML, not all of AML, but the vast majority of AML arise from uh, pre-existing clonal hematopoiesis, right? Uh, but we know that clonal hematopoiesis is a very, very common phenomenon in, 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 in the aging population, but obviously not everybody gets AML, right? So I think the, the, the main issue here is that we know uh, the risks associated with AML in terms of clonal hematopoiesis, but we don't know clonal hematopoiesis is a fertile ground, but we don't know who's going to get it. So un until we know, and you know, there's a lot of work now being done in looking at the role of inflammation in, uh, in uh, progressing clonal hematopoiesis to AML, but until we know what actually causes AML and when we can intervene, I think it's very difficult to use these very fancy technologies because remember, AML therapy is not trivial, right? We, we are, we're using cytotoxic agents, even venetoclax and HMA, these are myelosuppressive agents, they're not trivial. So you have to kind of out, you know, weigh the benefits and the risks. Uh, but I think we're, you know, we're getting there. Um, but can we detect early AML at this time? I don't think so. Uh, you know, or can we do anything about it? I don't think so. But there are clinical trials now in, in you know, uh, in progress that are looking at uh, not so much cytotoxic, you know, targeted therapies like IDH uh, inhibitors, 
for IDH mutant clonal hematopoiesis. And so I think there, there is hope, uh, but it's still work in progress. Uh, and then someone asked basic uh, changes in nomenclature, AML and MDS between ICC and WHO. So MDS should no more be called syndrome, but a neoplasm. Um, so I'll just tell you my personal practice uh, is I top line my reports is myelodysplastic neoplasm slash syndrome. Because I think, uh, first of all, you know, the two classifications are calling it two different things. And also, I don't want there to be any ambiguity for, remember, the people that are reading your reports are not all oncologists and they're not all, you know, very savvy other pathologists or clinicians. So someone may be reading your report that is trying to code the patient for a clinical trial. So I, I think our reports should be as inclusive and possible and as clear and informative as possible. So I put both in my report. Uh, there is another question that I saw that are there some major changes uh, that one should know, like, you know, I mean, from the recent classification regarding AML and MDS that that uh, that is to be included in the report? Uh, everything that we just talked about. <laughs> right. Okay. I think, yeah, that yeah. you have already explained everything. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So let me see if there is any other question that I see there. Mm -hmm. Uh So there was a question about the blast percentage, like, I mean, uh, that what should be the, like, you know, I mean, for the, um, wait, let me read that for you. So the question is about what should be the, like an exact blast percentage that is, should be used as a criteria for differentiating MDS from AML, but probably you must have already included in your talk. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this, right? So in, in the WHO, there are, uh, in the peripheral blood, 2% uh, and 5% are important. In the bone marrow, 5% and 10%. In the ICC, uh, really nine up to 9% is considered MDS, and then anything above 9% is considered MDS slash AML until you get to 20%, and then it's AML. And if you have genetically defining, uh, or uh, sorry, AML defining genetic abnormalities, um, then in that case, you know, the, the blast threshold uh, seems to be less important. So the WHO says increase blast and just, you know, kind of reading between the lines, increase blast in the WHO is 5% in the bone marrow. Uh, and then the ICC still requires 10%. You know, but, but I have to tell you, I think in um, this MDS slash AML does happen from time to time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not that rare to have that discrepancy of, MDS with increased blast versus MDS slash AML in, uh, in your everyday practice. But I do think it is very rare to have, let's say, an NPM1 mutated AML with, you know, myeloid neoplasm with 2% blast. I've seen it, but it's very rare. It's very rare to have a APL with, you know, no increase in progranulocytes. It's, it may happen, but it's rare. So in everyday practice, I think, you know, these, these dilemmas are, are more entertaining for talks, but in everyday practice, they don't actually happen as much. They happen occasionally. And then, you know, when, when they do, you just have to do your best to deal with them. Uh, and then someone says, uh, regarding genetically defined entities, what do you do when facilities may not be available? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So again, you do your best, right? So I think um, there are morphologic features that you know help us identify underlying genetics. And I think as hematopathologists, we're actually very good at this. If you think about it, we can recognize MDS with SF3V1 mutated almost, you know, I would say nearly always uh, with just an iron stain. Uh, we can recognize NPM1 mutated AML. Uh, by the cup-like blast, the phenotype that, you know, I didn't talk much about phenotype in, in this talk at all, but, you know, if you put together the typical amino phenotype and the morphology of NPM1 mutated AML, you can, with, with pretty good uh, confidence, predict that there's an NPM1 mutation. Obviously, IHC uh, seems to be more readily available uh, for, uh, for most laboratories. Uh, P53, you can do an IHC. So for most of these, I would say most of these, at least that have 
you know, immediate therapeutic implications. Uh, you, you can predict them with morphology. But I would also tell you that, you know, if you are truly in a setting where you don't have access to, um, let's say, next generation sequencing to pick up an IDH1 mutation or an IDH2 mutation, it's also very likely that you probably, your, your patient does not have access to the therapies that would change based on that mutation. So the patient would just get treated with a seven plus three regimen, regardless of what genetic abnormality you identify. So while it's unfortunate, I think practically speaking, your therapies are also gonna be limited where your diagnostic setting is limited. So it's probably not gonna make as much impact. Uh, but you know, you do the best, you do the best that you can with, with the, the resources that you have available to you. Uh, and then how to differentiate between MDS AML versus treatment related AML. Yeah, so that's a, you know, that's a good question. I think um, my own school of thought is, as you know, treatment related MDS has specific genetic uh, landscape, right? So these are uh, enriched for TP53 mutations, MLL or KMT2A rearrangements, uh, and, you know, complex karyotype. For me personally, even if a patient has a history of um, chemotherapy, if they get what genetically looks like a de novo AML, like let's say an NPM1 mutated AML, I tend to think that that's more coincidence than really therapy relatedness. So I try to describe that in my report. Uh, but again, I think what really dictates the outcome of the patient is the genetics of the disease. Uh, but if you have, uh, you know, on par genetics, let's say if you have TP53 mutated de novo versus TP53 mutated uh, therapy related, those patients tend to do worse. So I think that is important there. Yeah, I think uh, these are the questions that I saw on both Facebook and YouTube, Dr. Lagavi, and thank you so much for this excellent talk. My and pleasure. we really appreciate it. And uh, you would be happy to hear that we have so many viewers who join from different parts of the world. And I could see that we had viewers from countries as far away as Myanmar, Ethiopia, wow. uh, Kenya, Cambodia, Brazil, Mexico, That's India, amazing. to name a few. So thanks to our viewers for following us despite your different time zones, which is definitely not convenient. And I also saw there are a lot of students or residents who joined from Jorhat Medical College in Assam. So thanks to all of you guys. And if you guys like our lectures, please uh, follow Patchcast on different social media platforms like Facebook, uh, YouTube, you can subscribe. And we also have an Instagram account where you can follow us and on X as well. And on our website also the lectures can be found. And our next lecture is coming up on actually April 16th, which is very soon next week itself. So we will have a dermatopathology board review session and our speaker is Dr. Hadas Skapsky. So she is an assistant clinical professor of dermatology at UC Irvine. So hope to see you at that time. And thank you again, Dr. Lagavi. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.